was this actually you? Someone has logged on, hacked into your account, your Gmail? Okay. Um, again, you know, there, there's a lot of things that can be done on specific applications. The, the bigger point here is that we can reason that there has to be multiple something for this, all right? Because we're not sharing a shopping cart, we're not sharing a credit card, we're not sharing a ship to address. All right, each person is treated as a unit. This gets to the whole bit of session management. All right, in other words, if I go and do this, I run this in debug mode, let's say. Let me open up another browser and run this. put in 22 level of service average calculate. This one I'll put bunch of twos excellent calculate. Now, notice what happens if I click refresh. Still remembers that it's 22. So this session, the values associated with this session are kept separate than that. I go and I change this, I'm not changing the other one, you know, those two are operating independent, which if you think about it is a way you'd want it to work. So the long answer to your question is yes, there's, there's multiple instances of these classes, all right, one for each person that would be running it. Now, um, there are all kinds of things that you can do if you're talking about like massive applications, all right. That there, there's things that you can do if you're talking about massive applications to kind of uh, lighten the load, all right? But for our purposes, we can assume, yeah, there's, a, there's an instance of that page for everyone that's viewing the page. And the framework's taking care of all that. Yep. In fact, if we look, if we look at this, if we go and do a look at this, do a view page source, hidden variables and its view state is helping the server keep helping the server and the framework keep track of who is who. If we were to view source on the other one, first part of it was the same, all right, but the last part of it's different. In essence, that's help keeping the server, or helping the server and the framework keep track of who is who, just to, to, so that it can, it can maintain the state, and it keeps everyone straight as, as to who everyone is, all right? Other questions on this? All right, let's bring the checkbox in the play. All right. Um, let's make the assumption that if it's dine in, they don't get a tip. All right, so we'll simplify this. I, I don't know why you'd bother going in through this process of entering it, just say, I'm not going to tip you anyhow, but okay, we'll make that assumption. 
all right, just so that we can test some of these other controls. Now, so essentially what I want to do is right here, I want to test to see if that checkbox is checked. All right? How do you suppose I'm going to do that? What's my code going to look like? It'll be an if statement. All right, I'll give you that much. If checkbox equals true. Or if checkbox equals true. Or not checked. Okay. First of all, okay. First of all, what we have to do, you're close. First thing we have to do is we have to find a specific ID associated with that checkbox. Because keep in mind, we could have a bunch of checkboxes, right? We could have checkboxes for dine-in. We could have a checkbox for party over six. We could have a checkbox for rush order. I don't know. We could have a bunch of different checkboxes on here. So we have to point to the specific checkbox. And we do that via the ID. So in my code behind, I'm going to say if cb, and again, it's nice enough to prompt me for that, dine in. Now, this is an object. Remember, the checkbox is an object. There's all sorts of attributes associated with the object. So we can't simply say if the checkbox is true. All right, you corrected yourself, yes. which, was, which was excellent. All right. We um, want to test the checked attribute. And again, a lot of times the, the values are, are intuitive. The properties are intuitive. You know, what, what do we want to see? We want to see if the checkbox is checked. So sure enough, there is a checked property of the checkbox. And in this case, we want to actually check to see if it's false, right? We only want to do the tip calculation um, if it is false. Um, if, if, it's, if it's not checked. All right. We're not. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was thinking, I was, I was saying dine in, but I was thinking carry out. Right. We want to do this if it's true. Okay. So we can just say if CB dine in checked, because that's already a Boolean. Then we can go in, and I'm actually going to move this. And then I can put the ending bracket around the calculation. Now, notice how it did the indenting for you? That's excellent. Be sure your code is indented properly because once you start getting with these if statements, particularly if statements that are nested and, and have else's and all that, that can really be a pain to debug if, if, you're, if you're not careful with, with how your code looks. All right, so you want to take the effort to make sure the code is, is right. Now, in this case, again, now we're not going to do any calculation if it is um, not dined in. All right. No tip. Dine in. There's a tip. All righty. Can we validate that checkbox? No, not really. Right? We can't force them to check dine in. It doesn't make sense, right? If it's not dine in, it's not dine in. All right. As, as I was mentioned, the the one checkbox that typically we do validate is do you uh, approve of terms and conditions and all that. Questions. I was just wondering if it would be better, or just a, if this is just a point of preference to use a radio buttons checked dine in uh, carry out. Well, uh, you, the question is: is um, would it be better to use radio buttons as opposed to a checkbox? And that is entirely a case of personal preference. I thought so. Okay. All right. That's a design thing. I, I guess, um, you know, a couple, couple things that I would use to, to gauge my decision. All right? First of all, I would say, are the two alternatives clear? In other words, 
do, will it be obvious that not dine in means carry out? And if it is, then, yeah, you know, then, then a checkbox is okay. The other thing I would look to is, is there potential for multiple other options later on? Like maybe there is, I don't know, dine in, uh, carry out, and delivery, let's say, for example. So if I thought there was a chance that the options might expand, I might go for a radio button there, too. You had your hand up a second ago? Oh, I thought depending on the kind of restaurant, you know when you said if there's a clear choice for a default, like if it was a Chinese restaurant that had mainly takeout, then you would only have them check the box if it wasn't, like they, they only have to take that extra step if it's dine-in maybe, because like the, 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 it would be more like the default would be carry out. Yeah, I, I suppose you could word the, the checkbox such that They'd have to check it if it was an exceptional case. I, I suppose that would, you, you could do that. That, that isn't exactly related to, to what you were saying, but that, that's another valid point. I was absolutely curious. All right. Now, what I'm going to do is, in fact, let's go and do that. Let's go, because we haven't done a radio button yet. So, good a, good a, good a thing as any. So, I'm going to get rid of the checkbox. I'll get rid of the code for the checkbox, and I will... Uh, create a, a radio button for this. All right, so let's get rid of the code for uh, checked in or uh, dine in rather. All right, let's get rid of the checkbox and let's go and let's create a radio button group. We have two choices here. I'm sorry, radio button list. You have two choices, a radio button and a radio button list. Typically, you want the radio button list. Because if you think about it, a radio button is just an individual radio button. And yeah, you could do that. But typically, when you're creating radio buttons, you're creating a list of, of radio buttons. You want those to be tied together. All right? You want them to be treated as a unit. So if I pick um, a dine-in, it does one thing, uh, and if I check then carry out, it unchecks all the other ones, all the other options. So I'll go and I'll make this a radio button list. If you used a single radio button, would that be just like a checkbox using? No, actually a single radio button, you would never use a single radio button because how would you uncheck it then? If you were to, if I were to create one radio button, all right, and I checked it. All right. Then how could you uncheck that radio button? Just click it again. No. Nope. You actually have to no. create a button saying clear radio button. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So you never ever believe me. I've graded enough CISS 216 assignments where people try to put just a single radio button instead of a checkbox to know that that doesn't work. All right. What's 216? That's the intro to web development. Oh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I get. I, I get. That, that, you know, that's in the, for that assignment, that's definitely a top three error that people make. All right? Okay. So let's go in and let's go create this radio button list. And a radio button list, if you think about it, is really a lot like a drop down. Right? There's a list of text things. All right? Descriptions. Associated with those descriptions might be a value that that the, uh, a value that the uh, code behind needs, all right? And you can only pick one of them. That's actually only partly true. It's, it's true of a radio button. It's only partly true for a dropdown. By default, you can only pick one option. You can actually configure a dropdown to allow multiple selections. But that's rarely done because people aren't used to seeing that, all right? And, and, that uh, it, you could do something like pick all the things that you're interested in, and and have like a control click to pick several things, all right, uh, and, and you know, and then you could go and 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 it actually stores each value, but again, that's kind of confusing. People aren't used to seeing that, so I, I would steer clear from that. At any rate, so I'm going to go in here. I'm going to click Edit Items, and I'll do the same thing. I'll put in. Dine 
dying in. And maybe I'll put D for dying in. Oops. And then add one and click carry out. Now here's where you could go in and you could set the selected if, for example, you knew you were a restaurant that did more carryouts than, than dine-ins or, or whatever. I'm going to go then and I'm going to give a name to this radio button list. All right. So I'm going to give a name to the collection of these radio buttons. And I'll call it R R B dine in. All right. I'm going to go. I don't like how this is positioned. I'm not going to wrestle with it through the GUI. I'm going to go to source view and look at what's 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 doing in there. All right. There's a label for. It's part of that. Let's see what other attributes I have. One of the attributes I have is scrolling over that. Alright, I lied. I'm going to go to the GUI. I'm looking for ah, repeat direction. There it is. I thought it was something like orientation. And I can pick horizontal. Repeat layout. And now my thing is positioned the way that I would want it to be almost. With Probably don't need a label here. Um, let's see. Probably don't need this anymore. Oops. All right. I don't like the fact that actually the button is closer to the dine in. This is actually the button for carry out, but it's closer to the word dine in. So I'm going to go here, and there's an align field somewhere. <clears throat> Text align. Yeah, somewhere. All right, that looks a little better. Seems like you're doing sort of CSS and HTML and one. Well, what am I doing? Well, actually, you're doing ASP. I'm, but the I'm configuring the properties of the ASP.NET control. All right. I'm going in and I'm setting these properties. All right. Now, what does setting those properties accomplish? Setting those properties is going to accomplish. Um, generating the appropriate mix of HTML and CSS that it decides is the appropriate mix. All right, it might not do it, might not style it exactly the same way I would, but it's going to generate the the proper uh, mix of things. All right. So now um, I can go in and could probably do this a couple different ways. 
I'm going to go in here and say if RB dine in dot selected value equals D, then I want to go and do this. So if I go in and say dine in, it does that. Now, of course, I can have a radio button where neither of them are checked. All right? That's one difference between this and a, a drop-down. With the drop-down, there's always a selected value. With the radio button group, there's not always a selected value. But we All right. can validate that. So we can validate that, yeah. We could go and put a required field validator on, on that, and it'll be smart enough to know um, that that is, um, that is the appropriate choice. Questions about this? Just kind of a design thing. Mm -hmm. um, if you put, leave your drop down with select level of service, do you really need the label? Oh, probably not. Yeah, we could probably get rid of that. All right, let's look at your assignment. Let's look at your assignment, because your assignment is actually a two-part assignment. Yeah. And I'm open to giving an extension if that would help. Part of it is due 920, which is when? Thursday. Yes. All right. And part of it is due uh, a week from, from that day. So let's play it by ear, and if you're running into difficulty, let me know. Let's look at what your assignment is. Review LCC's tuition and fees chart. Create a page that will allow students to calculate their tuition by entering in their hours and selecting their residency status. The page should format and show the tuition for the entered parameters. The page and output should look professional. The page should make sure Valid values for credit hours and residency status have been entered and display an understandable error message if either is invalid. So we go to this page. All right. Notice that and again don't I, I don't don't worry about this part. I don't know what that means. Alright. But notice that there is uh, 1 through 22 credit hours. All they're saying is this fee, this is included as part of those, those fees. So you don't need to like add that on top of that. So you can be a Lorain County resident, you can be an out-of-county resident, and or you can be an out-of-state resident. Yes? Oh, no, I was just reading that's me. Yeah. Oh, which one? Out-of-county. Oh, really? Yep. All right. Oh, you're the one. Yeah, you're the one. Yeah. <laughs> We then have semester hours, and it implies that the valid choices for semester hours are 1 to 22. I don't know what happens if you try to enroll for 23 credit hours, but for our purposes, yeah, we can assume 1 to 22. You know, what the heck. It'll allow us to practice our validations of nothing else. All right. Obviously, you need both of these things to, to calculate. You need to, to know the residence, and you need to know the semester credit hours. Now, it's not a straight rate times hours, all right? Because at 13, you get charged the same amount for 13 through 18 credit hours. And then 19 through 22, it starts increasing again. So what you want to do, first off, is sort of figure out the pattern here, all right? Figure out, like, what the rule is for this, you know? Figure out and see if there's a pattern. All right.
Because by thinking through this, you can, you know, you could write really ugly code, or you could write pretty elegant code for this. Now, part of this assignment is an exercise in refactoring. All right, because part one is simply to get this to work. All right, just get it to work. Doesn't matter how you do it, you know. If it, you know, you could write a page that sends you an email saying, hey, you need to update the HTML for out of county and this, and you go and manually update the HTML, and that would almost be acceptable for this. By hook or by crook, just get it done. The second part then is creating a custom class for tuition. All right, and we haven't talked about custom classes yet, but, but we will. All right, so in lab three, all right, my suggestion would be the simplest way to do it would be to put your code, all your code, in the button click event. For part one. For part one. Oh, okay. For lab three. You don't have to do it that way. If you've done it some other way, you don't have to like go and redo it. But I'm just thinking sort of the simplest way, the path of least resistance. If, if you're unsure about some of the stuff, you're still working through it, whatever, the easiest way to do it will be to do like what I've done in this example. Put all your code in the code behind in the button click event. Now let's look at this button click event that we have here. Keep in mind, uh, I had a student with a question about this uh, yesterday. Keep in mind, this function is part of the framework. So you can't mess with the, the signature of the function. Right? You can change the contents of the function. All right? You can put anything you want to between those brackets. All right? But you can't change, for example, what this returns. Because a framework isn't expecting a return value. The framework is expecting you click a button, it's calling this function, it's not getting anything back. All right. In addition, the framework is expecting and is going to call this function with these two arguments. So you can't tack other arguments on here because, again, that's part of the framework. Um, this function is wired to that button, and when that button clicks, this function is going to get called, and it's going to get called in a very specific way. All right. Now, could you create your own custom function inside here to do the tuition calculation? Yes, but that's not required for this assignment. The first part of the assignment is just to get it to work. All right. And again, the simplest way would be to have a function, or I'm sorry, to, to, to code the button click event similar to how I do here, to gather up all the input, have a series of if statements, and then take the result and output it out. All right. Now, that's part one. Part two is to refactor it. And the main part of refactoring it is going to involve taking your code and putting it in a custom class. For the second part of the lab, for, for lab four, I'm going to be a little more picky about how good your code is, too. In other words, you know, um, in addition to moving the code to a custom class, I'm going to expect you to tighten up the code if, there, if there's anything in there that, that uh, uh, isn't so, so hot. And again, what would make the code better or worse? How easy it would be to maintain it. In other words, if the tuition chart were to change, they were to raise tuition, you know, $10 across the board, all right, per credit hour, how easy would it be to go in and change it? If the answer is very easy, then your code is good. If the answer is, well, it'll take a little while, and you're liable to forget to do this, and so it's going to mess up out-of-county tuition, well, then there's a bigger problem. All right. Um, you should have the tools to do the first part of it at least. All right. At the very least, you should have the tools to do the first part of it. Because you could write the code just as part of the event, all right, and you'll grab your values from your form and you'll do different sorts of manipulations, but you'll do this sort of manipulation. Now, the one thing that you want to do, one of the, the statements was, is to make it look professional. Therefore, figure 